Okay, there are a few people still trying to connect, but we will uh, proceed. Okay, good evening, everyone. The Ukrainian Canadian Professional and Business Association of Calgary, UCPBA, welcomes you to our online meeting. My name is Stephanie Savin, and I am treasurer of the organization. We are delighted that our guest speaker, Ms. Diane Francis, has agreed to address us today. For those unfamiliar with UCPBA, it was started in Calgary in the early 1960s and is part of the Ukrainian Canadian Professional and Business Federation, which itself was one of the six core organizing entities of the Ukrainian Canadian Congress. The Congress was established in 1940 as the umbrella organization of Ukrainian Canadian associations and legal societies. First, some procedural notes. Our plan today is to have everyone on mute with questions at the end of today's presentation being submitted by typing your question via the Q&A button or chat button as it is. Please add your name and location at the bottom of your question. Uh, first name is okay, as we would like to acknowledge participants from far afield. Our Vice President, Alex Tarayev, will monitor the Q&A session with technical assistance from Irena Zygmunt, our Program Manager. To ensure good quality uh, of audio, we remind everyone, please mute your mic and please do not have more than one advice active during the meeting. The meeting is being recorded and will be available through our Facebook page. Now a little, and maybe not just a little, about our guest speaker. Diane Francis was born in Chicago in 1946. She met and married a Canadian fellow, moved to Brampton, Ontario in 1966, and became a naturalized Canadian citizen. Her first writing job arose from an assignment at the Brampton Daily Times, which was required for a journalism course in which she had enrolled at the local Sheridan College. Unsurprisingly, her two-week practicum at the paper was extended to 15 months, and from then on, there was no looking back. Ms. Francis' achievements are almost too many to mention. Her work as a freelance reporter has appeared in major newspapers in Canada, including the Toronto Star, the Toronto Sun, Maclean's, and she was editor of the Fanto Post from 1991 to 1998, first woman editor. She continues to be a columnist and editor at large at its, at its successor paper, the National Post. She also regularly contributes to publications around the world, including the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, Daily Beast, Politico, Miami Herald, the New York Post, Huffington Post, Cave Post, now Cave Independent, and the Atlantic Council. In her spare time, <clears throat> she is involved in numerous other organizations and charities. She's the author of 10 books so far on mostly Canadian socioeconomic subjects. Her articles cover many topics, Canada's economy, Canada-US relations, kleptocracies, corruption, Russia and Ukraine, China, Trudeau, Trump, technology, energy, the environment, and many other topics of current interest. She has intervened, sorry, interviewed and written about hundreds of CEOs, billionaires, heads of state internal, international criminals, Interpol officials, big thinkers, quote unquote, and academics among them, Bill Gates, George Soros, Christine Lagarde of the European Central Bank, Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan, various US Treasury uh, and OECD and IMF officials and many others. She has participated at the Davos World Economic Forum for over 20 years, and she has been on the spot at many of the pivotal geopolitical events of our time, the fall of the Berlin Wall and of the Soviet Union, the Ukrainian Orange Revolution, the rise of Nelson Mandela and others. Since 2021, Diane Francis has been publishing a Substack newsletter twice a week covering all these topics. You can find links to these fantastic ideas and opinions uh, at our Facebook page, and on the UCPBA website. Currently, Diane Francis is a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council Eurasia section in Washington, DC. She is a distinguished professor at Ryerson University's Ted Rogers School of Management and has been a visiting fellow at Harvard University's Joan Schoenstein Center on Media, Politics and Public Policy. 
She's on the faculty at Singularity University in Mountain View, California, a distinguished visiting professor at Ryerson University in Toronto, and sits on the boards of the Hudson Institute's Kleptocracy Initiative in DC and the Canada-US Law Institute in Cleveland. She has won many awards for her work and has been granted three honorary degrees from St. Mary's University, from Ryerson University, and the Sheridan School of Business. However, the honor about which we are most enthusiastic is the Friends of Ukraine Tereza Award, given to her by the Ukrainian Canadian Foundation of Tadas Shevchenko in 2019. We acknowledge her unstinting defense of Ukraine in its struggle to finally escape from Moscow's grasp and to overcome its post-Soviet corruption hangover, as well as her generous support for our Ukrainian Canadian organizations. We welcome her thoughts on the uneasy situation in Ukraine and her assessment of the current crisis. As we all hope, Dai Bozhe Mernoho Neba, may God grant us peaceful skies. Please welcome Ms. Diane Francis. Hello, thank you very much, Stephanie. I'm pleased to be speaking. Uh, we, we organized this several months ago, having no idea that this date would be so uh, monumentally important to Ukraine <laughs> and, and in fact to the entire world uh, when we set the date. So uh, it's kind of an interesting coincidence, I guess. Uh, yeah, my background is I'm American, grew up in Chicago. I immigrated when I was 19 and I immigrated to Toronto and uh, we had a very large Polish population in Chicago. So I had a lot of Polish friends, but I, I don't think I'd ever met a Ukrainian person until I came to Toronto. And of course there's tons of Ukrainians as well as Poles and other Slavs in, to, in Toronto. And Canada in fact is probably the largest Slavic nation outside of Europe. Roughly 15 to 18% of the entire country is of Slavic background. And the largest group singularly would be the Ukrainians. So uh, it wouldn't be surprising that naturally I would make my, uh, many of my friends would be Polish or Ukrainian. And so, you know, we would talk about, we were all immigrants. We would talk about politics and things back home that were of interest to them or to me and so on and so forth. And so it was really through my friendships with Polish and Ukrainian um, fellow immigrants in Toronto that I uh, got uh, attuned to what was going on and started to pay attention. Um, as a journalist, of course, I was always interested in, in, in spreading my wings and doing new things. Uh, and you know, I, I was lucky to have uh, newspaper chains that would pay for me and a photographer to go anywhere we wanted through, through some of the biggest historical events ever. So my first trip to the former Soviet Union was in 1992 the day that the Soviet Union dissolved. And of course it dissolved because Ukraine left. That was really the, 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 the instigation, shall we say, for the whole thing to fall apart because Ukraine was so pivotal and so important to the whole uh, project. And I went with a Ukrainian friend, Bob Onishak, who I think you probably have heard of. He's on many of the Ukrainian organizations. He's a Toronto-based lawyer. And Bob is a friend of mine and I said, you know, my newspaper wants me to go with a photographer for 10 weeks anywhere in Soviet Union. And the first place I wanna go is Ukraine because I know there'll be a big audience back home in Canada for whatever I write about Ukraine. So off we went, we spent a week there. We did all kinds of things. We went to Chernobyl. We went to the countryside to co-opted farms. We went to markets. We watched ice fishing. We watched the first cathedral being opened. Uh, it was it was in a remarkable experience, and of course it was grim and gray and drab and impoverished uh, because it was still just coming just just having uh, left the Soviet Union and had a very long road to hoe. I met the first president, um, President Kravchuk, charming man, good looking man, bit of a flirt. And uh, had a very nice long chat with him. And he was really the architect of steering Ukraine out of the Soviet Union. Came from Western Ukraine and I think spent part of his childhood in Poland. So, you know, he was Western oriented and um, had been the first deputy that the Kremlin ever, uh, that the Kremlin ever appointed to take control over Ukraine that was not from Eastern Ukraine, Russian speaking. 
And that really was the big mistake for Russia to entrust its most important republic to a Western Ukrainian. Um, and so that's really why those events unfolded the way they did. Um, he talked to me in those early days about joining NATO, but there was absolutely no interest in joining NATO. And you know, the other problem that Ukraine has had, and I've realized, is that unlike Poland, Poland uh, got out from under the Soviet Union, but went straight into the arms of a midwife called the European Union, which taught it how to clean up its corruption, change its institutions, strengthen them, set up uh, processes, uh, downsize its government, spin off state-owned enterprises to get rid of corruption and privatize. And that's why the Polish miracle and the Hungarian miracle and the others happened so quickly. And now their living standards are four times higher than Ukrainians are because Ukraine was left uh, on its own in its, you know, as an independent republic now, um, once removed from the Soviet Union and didn't have a template, didn't have a midwife uh, Russia was going through all kinds of chaos, and so did Ukraine through this period. And so Bob and I came back to Canada and we started the Canadian-Ukrainian Chamber of Commerce because we said they really need to know how to do free enterprise. And so we did that and we were the founding um, people that started that. And, and so I've been back to Ukraine probably 20 times ever since professionally as a journalist to report on things. Um, and, and I retained an abiding interest to have many friends. And um, I, I was interested as a, on two levels. One area that I'm very, um, have been very involved in and written books about is white collar crime. And frankly, the Soviet Union was a criminal organization, wasn't a country, wasn't a government. And to a great extent, until pretty recently, so was Ukraine's government, it was a criminal organization. Oligarchs who were criminals were running the place, owning the judges, buying court decisions, and cheating the people and keeping them poor. So my interest in knowledge in white collar crime and how it works applied directly to the things that I could write about concerning what had to happen in Ukraine and uh, to, to clean up uh, the country and get it on track. Uh, the people were westernized. The people loved uh, loved the West, and they did not want to have any part of the the Russian uh, situation. And Russia went through all of its terrible cataclysmic uh, chaos after after uh, the Soviet Union fell apart. And as we know, Mr. Putin uh, came up through the middle. Yeltsin uh, anointed him to replace him, and we know now what it is. So, as a journalist, so white collar crime and corruption. Was, was something that I figured I could write about and contribute to helping do something about. I was a business writer. I had great con connections and contacts in the US and Canada. So Bob and I through the Chambers of Commerce connected business people and so on. Uh, and in fact, in 1994, Bob and I were approached by a Ukrainian entrepreneur to start a financial newspaper in Kiev. And it was called Financier. And, and we did. And I was uh, affiliated with the Financial Times of London because they own 25% of the Financial Post when I was the editor. And I went to them in London and I said, could this little newspaper get the stock market quotes for nothing and that will help put it on the map. And there was, believe it or not, quite a big advertising market there. Uh, as said our entrepreneur and he proved it of people that were starting banks or businesses that wanted to advertise. So the business model was put in place and about 35 people were hired. The former offices of a Soviet newspaper were rented and the printing press used. And so we were going along quite nicely. This is in 1994, when uh, 1995, when um, the dreadful Kuchma took over. And Kuchma, of course, was a Russian speaking Eastern Ukrainian who'd been a red director for the Soviet Union of companies in Ukraine. His wife was Russian and his wife his wife's, his brother-in-law was very close to Putin. A lot of people don't realize that. So Kuchma took uh, it away from a Polish model, a, a European model, and, and turned it into a Russian model. 
Ukraine. And that has been the problem that the people have tried to get out from under ever since. And that Russian model meant that, you know, he took all these companies, all the wealth of the country and divided it among his family and friends, gave them assets for nothing, called it privatization, and thereby created the oligarchy, just like Russia, exactly like Russia. Firtash, Kolomoisky, Poroshenko, all of them. They benefited from this uh, apportionment of the public wealth into the hands of a few people that were close to Kuchma. Kuchma is a bad guy, in my opinion. And, you know, he still is playing a role here and there. And in fact, uh, what was very upsetting is that when the Donbass was occupied and there were talks being held, he, he, he uh, represented Ukraine to the Russians over Donbass. I mean, this guy, a traitor. So what happened was while he was president, there was, he started to crack down on the press. And that included our little newspaper. And Bob and I got a call one day from our editor, our publisher editor, and said, you've got to help us get to Canada. They came in with baseball bats yesterday. They nearly beat the editor in chief to death in front of the staff. Everybody ran. They've seized the property. They've taken the newspaper and I'm frightened for my life. So this was what was going on. And I didn't go back to Ukraine for about six years because A, it was dangerous for journalists. This is at a time when journalists were disappearing, um, being murdered, um, and jailed, and so on. So Kuchma brought a reign of terror to Ukraine and set in stone a Russian oligarchy that, that is still the remnants of which is still there today and have, has to be overthrown and hasn't quite yet till we get rid of all the judges and have, have clean judges in place. So uh, that, that was sort of the, my experiences. And only the next time I went back to, uh, to Ukraine was the Orange Revolution. And I thought, this is amazing. Oh my gosh, this is unbelievable. And here were you know, millions of people out in the streets in the middle of the winter, protesting so that the Supreme Court of Ukraine, which was corrupt, but nonetheless could overthrow a rigged election by um, Yanukovych. And, and, and the, the court did under pressure. Uh, of course, the court was still corrupt and Mr. Yanukovych came back and won re-election re later with the help of Donald Trump's pal, Paul Manafort, <clears throat> and the rest is history. So it was a huge uprising, but it, what it did was it solidified a unity among the civil society. Uh, it, was, it was an amazing thing to behold and very unique for the whole Soviet Union. There was, there is not, a civil society in any of the other Soviet republics, including Russia, uh, like Ukraine's, where people have a community spirit, a common cause, soup kitchens were set up. I mean, the whole thing was quite, quite remarkable. And, and so they, they rose up, they overthrew peacefully that time. And, um, and then so, you know, uh, Yushchenko and Timoshenko got involved. They, turned bad as well. Uh, they succumbed to problems and to the corruption. It just overwhelmed them. Then Yanukovych got in again and stole about $100 billion from the people of Ukraine and also was a, a tyrant and a, a thief and, and a puppet of Putin's. So we know that what he did was he wanted to turn Ukraine's back on the West, the European Union, which had been very helpful with aid and visas and completely orient the country back toward Russia. Then we had the revolution of dignity and the students protested at Maidan. And once they started to get roughed up, the streets were full of the civil society again. Soup kitchens, hospitals, first aid people, protection people, entertainers, you know, all kinds of things. People would stop and leave, leave a loaf of bread they baked on their way to work as a show of support. It was, it was a, another remarkable show of civil society cohesiveness and pro-democracy, pro-rule of law um, values. And so as we know, it dragged on through terrible winter. And then of course, the Russian snipers were brought in, a hundred were killed, murdered in cold blood, peaceful demonstrators. 
People rose up. They were about to march on Yanukovych's hideously uh, excessive estate just outside Kiev, and he fled. He fled in the night. And he's in Moscow with his $100 billion, which I'm sure he's divided up between Putin and his other guys. So never the twain. And then, of course, that drove, there was no government in place. It was chaos. And that's when Putin made his move. Uh, weeks later, the tanks rolled in, the special ops rolled in, and they seized as much of Ukraine, about seven and a half percent of the land, by getting, by getting uh, Crimea and Donbass, part of, part of Donbass. And two million people fled, refugees, great cost to the country, uh, and 14,000 dead so far, and the war continues. The, the, Peace talks have never resulted in, in a ceasefire that's lasted more than hours. And so it continues, and this is part of Putin's hybrid warfare, not just against Ukraine. Putin is at war with Europe, with capitalism, with democracy, with the West, with the United States. That's what this is all about. And Ukraine's the front line. And so that's the reason why it's, I've always said Ukraine is an important country because it's, 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 it's the line in the sand in the Cold War 2.0. This is the Cold War, it never stopped. It was resurrected by Mr. Putin. And he is, he is very um, ruthless. And so he has uh, increased his power, <coughs> his hybrid war, <coughs> excuse me, has uh, not, impeded Ukraine from its march forward toward becoming a rule of law, democracy, uh, capitalist society. Um, it, it's, it's, you know, obviously not Poland yet because it doesn't have the European Union help, but it's getting there uh, faster than ever because of Putin's predations. Uh, this has actually been helpful in getting people behind fixing what needs to get fixed and putting the country on a course toward becoming a modern European nation, the largest country in Europe, with a talented population of 42 million people. Um, Putin, of course, uh, most lately has, has resurrected his, his strategy. Uh, and as we know, last April, uh, well, let me just go back a little further than that. Um, he has started to have, and this is Ukraine's doing, he has started to have unrest in Russia, Mr. Navalny and the predecessor who he, he murdered in cold blood. Uh, Mr. Navalny, Navalny, who's an enormously courageous hero in my opinion, um, was able to mount a very serious civil society uh, protests movement in Russia, the likes of which had never been seen before. He was a problem. And so Putin has, and, and Belarus also had civil society unrest in 2020, which was cracked down on by, um, by Putin. Kazakhstan had the same sort of thing. And there's, and Russia itself is restless. So a year ago, this crisis started. A year ago, Navalny came back to Russia after being poisoned the summer before. This is a year ago. And he had live streaming of his movements and his speech. And he came back courageously after being fixed from his poisoning by the KGB and came back to face the music and go to, go to court. And he said, People of Russia, rise up. They are frightened of you. And then they let him off in handcuffs to, to meet his fate. Two days after that press conference, which was viewed by most Russians and quietly applauded by many, he released, his team released a two hour um, documentary on Putin's palace. And I, I, if you have two hours, it is absolutely fascinating. It's two hours, it's on YouTube. It is the most watched 
video on YouTube in Russian history, even this year. So we know what happened. They stuck him in a gulag, trying to kill him there. Um, protests, huge protests, bigger than ever happened as a result of his jail sentence and the Putin palace tape coming out. And then the real serious crackdown happened. And so we don't know how many tens of thousands of Russians are in jail or gulags. Um, newspapers have been shut down, websites, a Russian who retweets a pro-democracy um, tweet on, online uh, can be arrested and thrown in jail for doing so. It is, it is enormous. Again, it is back to the dark old days, the reign of terror. And he's had to crack down in this way because things are shaky. Their living standards have fallen uh, steadily, the Russian people, their lives are terrible. Um, you know, their kids are sent all over the world in army, in armies uh, to kill people and get killed. Um, alcoholism is rampant, um, therefore depression is. Uh, I think the place is a mess and they really only have oil and gas going for themselves economically to support their gigantic military and so on. And so he wages his hybrid war against Europe, United States, capitalism, democracy uh, from his stronghold in the Kremlin. And, and that includes using mercenaries like the Wagners and using um, you know surrogates and operatives, little green men, all kinds of stuff, disinformation, cyber attacks. My, he's weaponized migration as he did in Belarus, bringing in Middle Eastern people and shipping them across by the thousands, trying to ship them across by the thousands into Poland illegally. He's cut off, energy is a big weapon. And so what he's been able to do uh, with the collaboration of a naive or maybe corrupt German government is grab 50% of the energy market share for the whole of Germany. This has been his greatest achievement. My newsletter, my current newsletter outlines how this has come about. Um, first of all, remember Putin was a KGB agent after this, his father was in Germany during the second world war, came back without his legs. Um, he, uh, he learned German Vladimir P Putin speaks fantastic German. He understands the Germans because he, he was a KGB agent posing as a journalist in East Germany uh, until the fall of Soviet. He knows Germany, knows he reads their stuff, he knows the people, he knows the, the whole thing. What he was able to do is co-opt Germany. Uh, so Germany now has 50% uh, of its power needs, oil and gas met by Mr. Putin. That is going to go up if his pipeline, which has been a big battle, is ever permitted. And I don't think it will be now. Anyway, uh, the point is that with, with Germany in his held hostage, essentially, held hostage, um, he has started to make his moves more aggressively. And thus the, the saber rattling over Ukraine the takeover of Belarus, which is something he didn't engineer, it just fell into his lap, but he, he certainly vigorously got involved in it. Um, he, and of course the invasion of, of Ukraine and Georgia. But what he's done is think about this, Germany is the engine of economic growth for Europe. It is the fourth largest econ economy on the planet and he can bring it to a halt tomorrow because he controls the oil and gas. So this is the leverage. This is why all of the other European Union countries could not stop. They voted against it, could not stop Putin's Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which is complete but not hooked up. And by the way, will never be hooked up now. But it's not just Nord Stream 2. There's, there was Nord Stream 1, Nord Stream 2, Turk Stream 1, Turk Stream 2. And my newsletter today has a map and you can see how he's, he's over the years built these hugely expensive pipeline projects, infrastructure projects to back out Middle Eastern sources, which are closer and cheaper like Azerbaijan and so on. 
and to get the gas market and therefore drive all energy prices at his discretion to play favorites. And he's done that. So I've written a lot about the Nord Stream 2 pipeline and, I, and before anybody was probably interested in it because I understood the strategic, this was not a pipeline, it was a weapon. And now we're seeing the result of this. So where are we now? Well, where we are now is it's good news, bad news for Ukraine. First of all, I never believed he was going to invade Ukraine. And I've written that. I never believed it. This is part of the, the hybrid war tactics. It's called, you know, it's the weaponization of fear. And so he was, you know, last April had 100,000 troops amassed at the border. That is roughly how many troops he's had amassed along Ukraine's border since 2014, because there's a war going on there. Supply chains, replenishment, that sort of thing. So this was all hyped. This was all spun. And, you know, the 100,000 now is supposedly 120, but maybe not. There's 30,000 in Crimea. The whole thing, and then there's naval warships in the Black Sea. The whole thing, what he's doing is he's just moving around props to generate headlines, fear, anxiety, to try and see what he can get. And during this time, everybody's forgotten about Navalny. Everybody's forgotten about poor old Belarus, which has slipped into the dark side. And now Belarus, whose dictator forbid Russian military from being inside its country until last year, now has his country controlled by Russian military. So it's a takeover. Um, so, so, so he's, he's, he's these, this, this saber rattling, the, the summit tree, the brinkmanship, all of this has been beneficial in terms of camouflaging what he's really doing in the other parts surrounding Ukraine. Uh, for Ukrainians, this is you know terrifying, but if you have friends and relatives, uh, and I have many friends, uh, they are strangely un, I wouldn't say un, they're concerned, but there's no panic. There's no panic. First of all, there's nowhere to go. They have to fight. This is their country. And they also know they're as good as the Russians, if not better. And they also know they have the second biggest, well, they have the second biggest military in all of Europe, except for Russia's in terms of personnel. They may not have a great air force and Navy yet, but that'll come. And they're getting armed by the West, the Americans and NATO. And, uh, you know, they, they now have a formidable force Think back to 2014 when the Russians first came across the border into Donbass. The army of Ukraine had been whittled down to 6,000 combat soldiers. 6,000. Now they have 250,000 combat soldiers and they have another 400,000 on reserve and another 400,000 veterans who are on the dotted line to, within hours notice, take up arms and join the cause. This is huge. Now, they could be bombed out of existence and that sort of thing, but that would be World War III. Putin is not stupid. He knows that Ukraine would be a bloodbath and, you know, impossible. So he's just playing with it. The metaphor that I like to use is that Putin's aim is to, as I say, uh, defeat Europe as a whole, and then the United States and the West. Uh, what, what we have here now since, so we had last April, he had, had these, these soldiers there. It led to a summit. Um, Biden made the mistake of waiving the sanctions to stop his pipeline, which looked like a show of weakness, but it was because Germany was terrified. Germany, it, people did not realize how dependent Germany had made itself on whatever Mr. Putin wanted to do and was willing to get in even deeper. So that was the, that was the problem. And so Biden said, OK, well, we'll do that. And, and so on. He, he had a summit. And then and then Putin, a month later, came out with his 5000 word speech saying Ukrainians were Russians 
and so were Belarusians, and so were Baltic people. I mean, you know, his crazy imperial stuff. And then, um, then he started to throttle back gas shipments. The price went crazy. The storage went down to nothing throughout the whole of Europe. People started to panic. Then he played the migration card out of Belarus across the Polish and Lithuanian borders, created fences and soldiers, a real, real fuss. So he's having a ball. He's having a ball. Still same number of soldiers on the Ukrainian's border that everybody talks about. Um, now there's more soldiers in, in Belarus and there's more soldiers in Crimea, but I still do not think that is the aim. Here's what I think we see is happening. The big picture is the West and Europe. That's the big picture. What we have now is what I call a hostage taking incident. Ukraine's a hostage. Europe is, Germany's a hostage. Europe is a hostage. He's holding the hostages. The United States wants to help, the rest want to help, but the hostages are going to die. There's going to be a problem. So there's been a lot of consensus gathering and meetings and so on. And I think this month, and this is in my newsletter today, this month I think we've seen Biden's solution starting to bear fruit. And what I mean by that is this month, more LNG tankers bringing gas from the United States mostly, but Australia, Qatar, wherever, into Europe. This month, more LNG gas has gone into Europe than Russia has shipped to Europe. What he's doing, he has given comfort to the Germans to go along with draconian sanctions to prevent Putin from going further because they will have a source of supply. LNG plants will be built like crazy in Europe. They already are. You're going to see oil and, and LNG diversion. I had no idea how much gas each of these tankers hold, each. And it's it, the compression is amazing. You people are from Alberta mostly, and so you know all about LNG. But this is Biden's weapon. He is fighting energy with energy. And so yesterday, he delivered a letter to Putin on behalf of the NATO members saying, we're not going to restrict membership to NATO. And we're not going to pull NATO troops away from Eastern European and the Baltics. And here are the sanctions we're going to impose. And they will, frankly, cripple and ruin the Russian economy. Uncharacteristically, but not surprisingly, because they also see the figures on LNG shipments and the fact that the United States and the Allies are quite capable of continuing to ratchet this up and completely fully replacing Russian gas and oil to a great extent from Europe. Um, they have signed off, the Germans have signed off on these draconian sanctions removing it from the banking system, the US dollar, access to the, the swift, uh, swift transfer, uh, crippling them, uh, crippling their um, energy exports, putting tariffs and bans on them, refusing to let technology and investment go into Russia, personal sanctions against Putin and his buddies, and probably actions inside countries where they hide their assets. These are draconian. So the reaction was today, Lavrov, the foreign minister of Russia said, well, this is, you know, no grounds for confidence. You've turned down our two requests on NATO and, uh, and on NATO and, and the pullback out of, out of hand. But we're going to, but the president wants time to think about this. It's the beginning of a climb down. This is the beginning. This is the face saving off ramp because I think Russia has been beaten at its own game. 
And if you look at my newsletter, you'll see the charts. The Americans are building an LNG uh, facility uh, from their huge surplus of gas and Canada's. Canada's just signed a couple of major uh, gas deals with LNG, uh, new LNG facilities in Texas this week. They're gonna be drawing on, on Canadian gas and their own fracked gas. And they have got not unlimited supply, but Europe is going to be fine because they're gonna restructure the energy architecture to save the continent from Mr. Putin. And so that's what I think is in motion. I hope I'm right. Uh, I could be wrong, but I'm a student of energy and I know how this kind of stuff works. And, and uh, so what they've done to use the hostage taking in, uh, it, it, metaphor, you know, when you have a hostage taking, say there's three or four hostages. In this case, America's a hostage, Germany, Europe, NATO, they're hostages in Ukraine. You take a hostage out, right? And you rough them up a little bit to scare the others. That's what Ukraine is getting happened to hit. That, well, that's what he's doing with Ukraine. He's roughing up one of the hostages and that's Ukraine, because he can. And that's why the Ukrainian resolve and the leadership in the Defense Department and so on has been, I think, done as good a job as anybody can do given this fabricated crisis. And in recent days, you'll notice also feeding my theory that the LNG is going to put the boots to Mr. Putin once and for all, is that you see the Ukrainians, the defense ministers saying, we don't think there's gonna be an invasion. Saying that, we don't think there's gonna be an invasion. Why would he say that? He's saying that in concert with the rest of the allies who say, we got them on the energy side, the Germans realize their backs are covered, so they're going to go along. And, you know, we got to help them find an off ramp, a face saving. So if the Ukrainians say there's going to be no invasion and there's no invasion, then Putin doesn't look like a fool. I think there's some very interesting geopolitical maneuvering going on here. So, what is the benefits for Ukraine? Well, it's pretty disruptive, clearly. Um, I've come across information that says that 600,000 Ukrainians left this year and never came back. So this could be the usual attrition as a result of the visa program, the generous visa program, but I think it also has to do with the saber rattling. This is not helpful for the country. And these are young people. And there's already 5 million Ukrainians working in Western and Central Europe, sending money back, which is great. But what we want is we want a strong, prosperous, uh, free enterprise, democratic and just uh, Ukraine so that it can take its place, its appropriate place. And I think that has been sped up quite dramatically along by the fact that now Ukraine is going to clean up its judiciary. There's already been some changes made and announced. I think it's got, um, it's going to start to speed up privatization and sell off state owned enterprises. And that's, that's the biggest source of corruption is the state owned enterprises, the bribes that go on there. And that will make a more um, uh, vibrant economy if things settle down. Um, they do have free elections. You may not be happy with the outcome of the election, but uh, at least there's not a crook. There's not a crook in the presidency. Uh, and, and so I think you're seeing reforms are going to be accelerated. I think Europe is going to, Europe and America are going to really demand it now. There's going to be strings attached to all this aid and comfort. And there should be, because that's good for the Ukrainian people. Because the faster they sweep, sweep their house clean of corruption and incompetence, the faster they can take their their rightful place. Uh, so I'm very confident um, considering what Ukrainians were up against in 1992. Yes, there's been a lot of setbacks and a lot of heartache and a lot of problems, but my God, it's a remarkable place. And the other thing that I've realized in my years of being there is that another reason that 
um, Ukraine was so important to the Soviet Union was, and the reason why so many Ukrainian people are respected and done so respected and done so well when they immigrate abroad, is that Ukraine was the Silicon Valley of the Soviet Union. The space program, the scientific research, the armaments, the weapons, all of that was devised by Ukrainians. Ukrainians are smart. They're educated and disciplined. They're ambitious. They find out how to solve problems. It's probably partly the agricultural work ethic that, that is bred into the bone. Uh, unlike the Russians who, who are, I think, quite damaged people as a result of all the uh, terrible ways that they've been punished by their governments and their czars and their communist dictators over the years. Ukrainians are not like that. So what, what you have is the, the Silicon Valley of the Soviet Union has left the Soviet Union totally impoverished brain-wise. And I think Putin knows that. And the other thing is that this is also the reason why Ukraine has, during all of this upsetness, created one of the most vibrant IT sectors in the world. Major Silicon Valley startups have come out of Ukraine and become gigantic companies, Grammarly among others. And so I became involved with startups there I've been part of the software community there because of my interest in Silicon Valley and as a business writer. And this is the most talented country in Europe. And so that's my optimism. Where's Alex for the Q&A? Alex? I'm already here. Sorry, I wasn't about to reply back to one of the guests here. Okay, so let's start the Q&A. Sure, sounds good. Um, well, great presentation, Dan. Thank you so much. Um, we have quite a few questions here, so I'll start reading them. From Marko Levitsky, Canada has never provided lethal weapons to Ukraine, including during yesterday's announcement. Is there some underlying reason for this reluctance? Um, I would also point people, they could go on Google and search me, Diane Francis, Atlantic Council, Canadian Diaspora. I wrote a very tough-minded article uh, on Monday about uh, the foot dragging and the lack of support by the Canadian government, which is quite shocking given the size of the diaspora. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's gotten noticed and people are upset. This, uh, I placed it in the Atlantic Council uh, because this places it right in the middle of Washington DC Beltway. This has embarrassed the Trudeau government, no end. And it was within hours after we published it that they scrambled and came up with re, uh, rebooting the Unifier program, uh, a few more bucks, uh, but it's a disgrace. It's a disgrace. And frankly, I hope I don't offend too many people. I think our prime minister and his entire government has been a disgrace since 2015. Thank you. Um, so next question we have from Myron Lahola, and like I read it the way he wrote it and I'll leave it up to you how to answer it. Um, what is Tucker Carlson smoking or he is perhaps paid by Russian interests? He is a, uh, a media whore. That's what we call them a media whore. Uh, I don't think he's ideologically uh, anyway. I think he just seeks out attention and, and uh, likes to make waves. What I find very, very curious about this is I don't know many, if many of you know his background. Uh, Tucker Carlson's a you know, very right wing guy in the US context. Look. He's a Republican and he's to the right of the Republicans. I, for instance, am a right wing, I'm a conserv I'm a Canadian conservative, but that makes I'm that that puts me left of the Democrats. 
because their their spectrum is so far to the right compared to who we are and most other countries. Anyway, he's in that that wild spectrum. But here's the background, and I find some kind of weird, twisted Oedipal thing going on with this guy psychologically. His father ran Voice of America for years in Europe. Think about that. His father was putting the word out to all the Soviet satellites, places like Ukraine, in their languages, hopeful broadcasts, stirring up hopes that people could bring about democratic reform and get out from under the boot they were living in. His father did that. And then this guy is backing the very kind of tyrant that his father spent a career trying to overthrow. So there's some kind of Oedipal thing. Daddy didn't give him enough attention, I guess. Thank you, Dan. So the next question is from Ihor Kruk. Uh, will the LNG shipments have to pass by the naval shooting exercises Moscow has planned off the coast of Ireland and England? Uh, if you go to my newsletter, you'll see the map of where all the LNG ports are. And there, there's uh, tons of them, there's dozens of them. They're all over the place. Um, and they've been delivering, I mean, LNG has been um, a big business in, in Europe for a long time. In 2020, the United States became the number one LNG supplier to Europe, surpassing Qatar and, and Russia in 2020 before all this, this stuff happened. And so all they've done is gear up and Biden has also put pressure on the other allies, the Saudis, for instance, who are in OPEC with Russia, are committing to huge diversions of oil shipments to Europe in case there's a supply problem. And so, you know, they're, they're really putting the pressure on and they're, they're helping, they're going to help Europe wean itself from uh, the, the, the grip of, of, of Russia and release them from the hostage status they're now in. And so, uh, the naval exercises off Ireland, by the way, Ireland is one of the few countries in Europe along with Switzerland and Sweden and Finland that aren't, isn't in NATO. Um, but Ireland is, uh, is nothing. I mean, this is nothing. Uh, it's just, you know, harassment, mischief, uh, things here, there, uh, and they're leaked into the press. They're mis misinterpreted on purpose or accidentally. All of this is designed to create uh, unre uh, upsetness and anxiety. Uh, the, the, the issue is that the LNG is getting to Europe. And I would say a year from now, there'll be probably twice as much LNG coming into Europe and maybe we can shut down Russia's supply altogether. That's the goal. And it's, it's absolutely doable. And if they want to have some target practice with LNG tankers here and there, well, Russia has a lot of uh, LNG tankers on the ocean too. Two can play that game. So, you know, it, it, Putin is not stupid. He's just evil. Thank you, Dan. Uh, so the next question from Daria Romanish. Um, you mentioned Poroshenko as a recipient of Kuchma's largesse. Uh, what is your opinion of the treason charges against him? I don't know. Uh, they, they do have uh, bonafide investigators doing this. Uh, it, it sure looks like it's, you know, uh, political vengeance, but uh, Mr. Poroshenko has always had a very big odor around him. Let me put it to you that way big odor. You know, for instance, he's not just, a, just doesn't own chocolate factories. He was operating chocolate factories in Russia after Russia invaded Ukraine as president of Ukraine. Uh, he does big business in China that people don't know about. Um, he, he also, I'm told, is probably the largest private, single private landholder of agricultural land in Ukraine. People don't know that. 
probably why he didn't want land reform to happen, except in under his terms. Thanks. So I don't want to I don't want to prejudge, uh, but I I will tell you that I have friends in the Rada, and you know they're mixed. Some some like him, some don't. Some thinks think Zelensky is just uh, being political. Uh, that's not my information from the anti-corruption people that I know. Sure, thank you. Um, so the next question we have from Mary Krivaluk, or Krivaluk, sorry. Um, what do you think will happen with Crimea and Donbass? <sighs> Whoa. Yikes. It's a loaded question. <laughs> well, uh, Putin is not going to give them up if he doesn't get something in return and he shouldn't get anything in return. He should be forced to withdraw. I think that you're going to see if, once this settles down, if I'm correct, it'll settle down. We'll be, we won't be in a crisis situation. Uh, Germany will be you know, able to drive their cars on the Autobahn and heat their home and keep their lights on with LNG from Texas or Qatar or Australia, okay? And so, you know, the leverage isn't there. When the leverage isn't there, uh, then we'll see what happens. But um, I think once the crisis is passed and the energy weapon is destroyed through replacement, um, you've got a situation where I think you're gonna find the Europeans and, and maybe other parts of the world are going to diplomatically rise up against Putin in a way that is going to be um, not only economic sanctions, I'm talking about kicked out of WTO, I'm talking about off the Security Council or declared as a terrorist nation by the United Nations General Assembly. There are a number of things that should happen here and, and must happen and I think will. I think people, we get through this I think people can say enough of this thug, enough of this. And I think uh, there'll be some serious consequences for him. And, you know, as John McCain once described Russia, it's a country pose, it's a gas station posing itself as a country. There's nothing else there except a, an army and oil and gas. And once you impair their oil and gas, you know where that drives them? They're only going to be able to sell their oil and gas to China. And China wants Siberia. Think that one through. China wants Central Asian and Siberia. Good luck, Mr. Putin. So the world is going to, you know, squeeze him. And he's not going to, the one thing he can't get or steal or, or occupy is, is, uh, is uh, eternal life. So he's not going to be around forever. Sure, thank you, Dan. Uh, so the next question we have from Stella Renuk. Uh, how's the Ukrainian agriculture sector reforming in recent years? I'm not up to speed on that as much as I should be. Land reform is an absolute necessity because what that will do is it will liberate the countryside, uh, which is now stuck with small holdings on lands they don't own, and so they can't, they can't develop, they can't develop agribusiness, uh, they can't get use land as collateral to build barns or to build out operations or to plant uh, alternative dr uh, crops to diversify into livestock or abattoirs and all the other things, dairies and breweries and distilleries and all the things that you want to have happen. Uh, in your countryside. So it's pretty, pretty moribund and, and slow moving. And, and that's, that's the problem. Um, again, I, I do, do also want to make the point on Poroshenko. Uh, Poroshenko um, is, a, is a very ruthless businessman who I'm sure has cut corners because they're allowed to there. But he was, he was a stand up president when it came during 2014, getting things going, building the army. I mean, the, the, nobody's black and white, but he's not the guy who should be president again, ever. 
Jen. Uh, so the next question we have from Andrew Ilnitsky. Is there, is there a link between Putin and the Green Movement in Europe where Germany has cut back on conventional oil and power in Absolutely. Europe, okay, oil. The, uh, yeah. the, the Russians have financed the anti-fracking movement all over the world. The Russians have financed the anti-oil sands movement. The Russians have backed anything that will reduce the competition from other sources of oil and gas. Absolutely, that's known. They're probably behind the anti-nuke movement too, which is, what, which is the biggest mistake apart from electing Hitler that Germany's ever made getting out of nuclear, which has put them right in the palm of Mr. Putin. That's what my newsletter is about today. Crazy. Thank you, Dan. Um, so next question, uh, what is your view on current Ukrainian President Zelensky? I think Zelensky, uh, I had big fights with some of my friends my, my Ukrainian friends over this, they like Poroshenko, you know, better the devil we know. And he looks, he's very distinguished and he's a business guy and this other guy's just a comedian and this is a joke and he ran on a joke. First of all, he didn't run on a joke. Secondly, he's a lawyer. Thirdly, he's a millionaire many times over because he is a brand name in the Russian world of entertainment, Russian speaking world of entertainment. His movies, his comedies and his satires and his TV series, Servant of the People. By the way, if you haven't seen it, it's on Netflix. It's phenomenally funny and it's very smart satire. It goes to the heart of everything that was wrong uh, in Ukraine, uh, very smart satire. So I, I defended him and I was the first person in the, the diaspora to say, this guy would be a better president than the one we have now. And, and, you know, I got a lot of stick for it. But I think that, first of all, he's not experienced. Um, who is experienced in democratic government in, in a place like Ukraine? Not many. Uh, it's a very tempestuous, difficult uh, country to govern. I think he has represented the country very well. Uh, I think he handled that terrible uh, Hunter Biden nonsense with Trump, uh, with with uh, uh, with a plum, with dignity. He didn't say the wrong thing. I mean, that was another case of Ukraine being a victim. And uh, you know, I, I think he's done. He's done fine. Um, there's going to be another election. There's a lot of very promising people in the RADA and in the anti-corruption movement and in the business community uh, that indeed uh, I think will, will rise to the fore and, and give him a contest. One thing he said, and one thing that's very important, and I think that Mr. Zelensky's election really got Putin mad, madder than he already was, is because I'm told if you go to a Russian household today, and you go to people's DVDs or their VCR tapes or whatever, you will find a Zelensky movie there. He's a household word. He's like the George Clooney of the Russian world. And I don't think people realize that. So when he was elected, this popular, likable, smart movie star was elected as president of Ukraine, that was not good. Uh, to have happen for Russia. People took notice of that. And the night that he got elected, because he's a performer, I don't know how many of you watched, you can see the tape, but it's there. This was profound. He looked at the camera, everybody's drinking champagne and all happy and everything. He looked right at the camera and he said, to the people of the former republics of the Soviet Union, Look at what we've done here tonight. Anything is possible. 
And I think Putin flipped, just flipped. That's a very, very often quoted and shown um, strip of video on Russian uh, social media today. Thank you, Dan. Um, so the next question from Daria Rom Romanish. Uh, will the sanctions affect the money laundering and hiding of Russian billions in London and other financial centers? Yeah, I think so. I think it will. Uh, and I think that Putin, you know, as I say, I think Putin's overplayed his hand, which is natural. When you're a dictator, nobody's criticizing you or uh, talking you into compromised behavior. Um, he's getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And now we've got this crisis that's completely fabricated and is going to result in him losing possibly half or most of the market he has and his economy, any prosperity that they, they were hoping they were going to get. Uh, but it also is a case of, of um, he, um, the question was about, what, what did, I, I kind of lost so my- The question was, would sanctions affect the money laundering and- Yes, yes. Laundering? So I think that now, um, Putin's overplayed his hand. And what he's done is he's not only inspired and unified, and motivated the Ukrainian people, but also Europeans and Americans into taking a look at Putin and seeing him for what he is. This guy is trying to start a Cold War. He is very dangerous. And so I think his name is Mud. And I think that means that all these um, oligarchs that run around in New York and, and, and the flesh pots of, of the Mediterranean and the Caribbean and and in London, which is called London Grad now, there's so many of them. Um, I think that they're, they're persona non grata, and I think we're gonna see uh, a lot of Magnitsky actions taken and cleanup of, of the secrecy uh, that's allowed in the United States and in Canada. I don't know about Canada, but I don't know any, anything about this, this government we have in Ottawa is a joke. But um, certainly the, the British and the Americans are looking at very seriously uh, cracking down, and this just gives wind behind them. This is going to result. This is going to result in widespread disruption for Russian, for for Russia, and for the oligarchy. Thank you, Dan. Um, so the next question, you can talk about it, but um, I'll read it anyway in case if you want to. Add Sorry, I hear some scratching. One second. So um, from Vladko Boychuk, uh, do you believe that economic sanctions have been or will be effective to prevent Russian invasion into Ukraine? In case if you'd like to add something. Well, I've kind of explained how it all fits in. The economic sanctions flow from the fact that the Americans have put together an initiative that will back out Russian energy from uh, holding Europe hostage. And once you've done that, then you can just slap, slam them with these sanctions. Sure, thank you. Um, we have a question from Stephanie as well. Um, were you surprised by Angela Merkel's seeming about face with respect to Putin and Russia? Angela Merkel has left Germany in a mess. And so has Gerhard Schroeder, her, her predecessor. Schroeder, uh, has been a collaborator with Putin. He's an insider and he's now a Russian oligarch himself. And he came up with the Putin uh, pipeline idea, the Nord Stream 2, uh, the Turk Stream. Uh, he has, he has uh, um, been uh, the fifth column inside the German elite uh, on behalf of Putin. He's a bad guy. He's now the chairman of the board of Rosneft, which is the largest oil company in the world, which is Russia's uh, oil company. And before that, he was the chairman of Gazprom. So he just goes from trophy, uh, chairmanship trophies, getting very rich. And he was the chancellor of Germany for five or six years. And then he has been working behind the scenes uh, for R Russia uh, inside Germany and Europe. And Merkel has uh, helped him. 
unwittingly or otherwise naively, or because she had to, because she was in coalition with the Socialist Party, which is, which is uh, Schroeder's party. And so she stick handled all this Nord Stream stuff. I mean, imagine the Nord Stream 2 pipe, pipeline was rejected twice by the entire European parliament. The only country that voted for it was Germany and they still didn't care and went ahead. I mean, you know, something wrong with the, the, the European setup. Thank you. Um, so we have a question from Ina Platonova. Um, what are Russia's per, uh, prospects for democracy after Putin is done or it's too late? And what are your predictions for Russia's future after Putin? Well, it depends on when it happens and how. Uh, I think Navalny and the rest of the, the entire anti-corruption movement has been put in its place uh, forever, unless a regime comes along that lifts, lifts the controls over them. So the, the potential of developing a unified, civil society movement for the betterment of the nation in Russia is impossible with this regime. However, if Putin goes, it's very questionable as to, I mean, he has no successor. Um, and, you know, I think the, the bad guys might just, you know, leave town and take their trillions with them and leave behind an impoverished company in chaos, a uh, country in chaos. I think that there's also partition problems inside, um, inside uh, Russia. You know, I mean, the, the republics have spun off into their own individual entities, but par parts of Russia, Bashkortostan, Tartarstan, I've been there, and in Siberia are very restive. I mean, their living standards are worse than India's. And so, you know, it, it I think that you, you could find, now, none of that comes to fruition as long as there is a tyrant in charge like Putin with a, a not only an enormous military, but a nuclear arsenal and a private, security police force of brown shirts that numbers a million who go in and you know terrorize people so i think it'll remain that way as long as he's alive thank you man uh, so i think we'll take the last question out of respect to everybody's time um so Andrew Ilnitsky again, uh, where does Turkey fit in the whole issue? Turkey is, uh, I, I'm quite pleased with Turkey actually. Uh, Turkey has, is a member of NATO, one of the most powerful members in NATO, has a huge armed force, but it has had to play footsie with everybody. It has aspirations to become a Muslim power in the Middle East and certainly to protect its border from Kurds or Syrians or whatever. Uh, it also has Black Sea problems with its big giant neighbor, Russia, who is, let's face it, invaded two of the bordering Black Sea nations uh, since 2008. I mean, Georgia and then, and then Ukraine and Moldova. So Turkey is is very careful and obviously has to be very concerned about Russia too. Now, Turkey has signed a very major defense agreement with Ukraine, which was a huge victory for Zelensky in my opinion. And Turkey inside the NATO meetings has been a vociferous advocate of letting Georgia and Ukraine in as fast as possible and has been completely supportive in terms of sending weapons, lethal weapons, humanitarian aid, and as I say, the trade they have a trade association and a def defense association. Turkey is Ukraine's best partner at this point. And it, it's a very powerful partner. And they also control who goes in, in into and out of the Black Sea. 
So they have a very, they have a very strategically interesting, they also uh, are the hub for Azerbaijani gas that has ambitions to go into Europe. So there's a lot of things going on. Turkey on balance, I know that people don't like uh, the Erdogan, they think he's a bad guy and so on, but it is a democracy and on balance, I would say that Turkey is a force for the good. Thank you, Dan. Um, if you don't mind, can I ask you a question from myself? Um, so the first time I met you was at, at Trezoup event when you uh, got that award in Toronto. And uh, I was just curious, like you support Ukraine a lot. And um, how did you become so interested in Ukrainian issues? Well, I, I uh, became involved in Ukraine because I had Ukrainian friends and because there's a lot of Ukrainian people in Canada and because I'm a journalist and I go where the story is. And to me, Ukraine is the biggest underdog story in geopolitics right now. It's been an underdog. It's trying to get ahead. It's done better at getting out from under the nonsense than any other underdog and it's gonna make it. And so I root for the underdog, I'll do whatever I can. And I've had the privilege of being able to go there, meet people, see firsthand, interview thousands of Ukrainians, been to the war front, the revolutions, in the, I have a, one of my best friends is in the RADA. Uh, she was my software startup partner. Um, you know, I mean, I just, uh, I, I have, an, I have an affinity and an attachment to it. And also it happens now to be the most important, at the center of the most important geopolitical story. This is, this is you know, close to the 62 missile crisis. Although I think the tensions are now ebbing because I think uh, Mr. Mr. Putin is looking at either losing his means of making a living by getting pushed out of energy, the energy market in Europe, or he's looking at economic sanctions that'll sink his economy. So he's looking at disaster. And then um, thank you so much. Uh, great, uh, great event. Um, I have to pass uh, mic to our president Jarvis Kasawan for closing remarks. Um, and let me add him as well here. Dan, thank you so much once again. You're welcome. Thank you, Leanne. Ladies and gentlemen, members of the Calgary UCPBA and friends and guests from other parts of Canada, thank you so much for having joined us this evening for what can only be described as a remarkably insightful, thought-provoking and thoroughly riveting presentation on the current situation in Ukraine by our distinguished guest speaker, Diane Francis. Ms. Francis has demonstrated yet again with dazzling clarity why she is so highly regarded and sought after as a public speaker, commentator, innovative thinker, political, economic, and social analyst, and of particular significance to all those present this evening, truly one of the most dedicated, dynamic, and resolute supporters of liberty, democracy, and the rule of law worldwide. And just as important, a free, independent and sovereign Ukraine and of the fundamental and basic rights of the Ukrainian people to determine their own future free of interference, intimidation and threat of war from Mr. Putin and the Russian Federation. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm certain that I speak for all of us in expressing our deepest gratitude and appreciation to Mrs. Francis for her excellent presentation this evening. In that regard is our custom in Calgary, UCPBA, to offer our invited guest speakers a heartfelt, if modest, token of our appreciation by making a $200 donation in their name to a charity. For more of the ad's perspective and provocative take on all things topical, political, we would encourage our listeners to view the ad's website. Links will be posted on our UCPBA website and Facebook page. We are planning on engaging additional stellar speakers for the future. Thank you one and all, and especially Ms. Francis for being with us this evening. Slava Ukraina. Here, here. Okay, I guess we're done. Bravo. Everybody, thank you. Thank you very much, Dan.